the former church of Hagia Sophia is, quite simply, one of the most important buildings ever constructed. It encapsulates classical architecture. It epitomizes the achievements of Roman engineering. And it symbolizes civilization. For almost a thousand years, Hagia Sophia was the cathedral of Constantinople. It was here that Byzantine emperors were crowned. It was here that the Orthodox patriarchs presided. And, then as now, it was here that visitors came face to face with the ancient power and enduring glory of the Roman Empire. Welcome to this third episode of Virtual Vacations. As usual, I'm Dr. Garrett Ryan, and it's my pleasure to welcome you on this historical tour of Hagia Sophia. Before we start, a bit of historical background. In the year 532, when Hagia Sophia was begun, Constantinople had about half a million inhabitants, and was known from Scandinavia to China as the world's biggest and richest city. Since Rome and the rest of Western Europe had fallen more than a half century before, Constantinople was also the undisputed center of the Roman Empire, and sole seat of an imperial tradition that stretched back to Augustus and beyond. The emperor was Justinian. Although he had only occupied the throne for five years, Justinian was well on his way to becoming the most important Roman ruler in centuries. He had almost completed his great codification of Roman law. He had begun to prepare the campaign of conquest that would reclaim North Africa and Italy. And he had begun to build churches in every corner of his far-flung domains. He may have already been considering the reconstruction of the empire's greatest church, the Cathedral of Hagia Sophia, when a disaster forced his hand. In the center of Constantinople, where Hagia Sophia and the Imperial Palace stood almost side by side, was the Hippodrome, where the wildly popular chariot races were held. The two racing factions, the Blues and the Greens, supplied charioteers, chariots, and horses for the races. Each faction had its legions of rabid fans, who rioted when their favorite drivers won, when their favorite drivers lost, and whenever else they felt like a little light hooliganism. Usually, these disturbances were easily quelled. But in January 532, after the emperor refused to pardon some rioters, the factions united in rebellion. For almost a week, gangs of armed men roved around the palace quarter, looting and burning. Justinian, prevented from fleeing the city by his resolute wife, Theodora, only managed to suppress the rioters by massacring most of them. By the time it was all over, more than 30,000 lay dead in and around the Hippodrome, and the city's greatest church, the Cathedral of Hagia Sophia, was in ruins. Justinian began to rebuild almost immediately. To design his new church, he appointed Anthemius of Trales and Isidore of Miletus. Neither man was a professional architect. Anthemius was a mathematician and physicist, who had once built a steam-powered earthquake machine to terrify his neighbors. Isidore seems to have been a professor of geometry and mechanics. Together, Anthemius and Isidore produced the bold and unique building we see today. Work began little more than a month after the riots, and was completed in only five years. The new church combined elements of the long and narrow basilica layout, traditional in Christian churches, with a basically centralized plan. The most striking feature, then as now, was the colossal central dome, which crowned a cascade of sub-domes, and seemed to levitate upon a ring of windows. But no expense was spared in any part of the building. The floors and walls were paved in marble, Columns from distant quarries graced the aisles. Fields of gold mosaic glittered on the dome and ceilings. Despite a millennium and a half of earthquakes, fires, and turmoil, much of this splendor survives almost intact. Let's take a look. In Justinian's time, the exterior of Hagia Sophia had a clean and elegant profile. But, thanks to 15 centuries of additions and buttressing, it's pretty untidy these days. The brick minaret was set up by Mohammed the Conqueror. The other three were built about a century later and designed by Sinan, the greatest Ottoman architect. Originally, Hagia Sophia was fronted by an atrium, a broad courtyard, about 160 by 100 feet, ringed by colonnades, with a monumental fountain in the center. Today, only a few broken columns remain, and we enter the building directly through its outer vestibule. The outer vestibule, or exonarthex, is a utilitarian space, with walls of plain brick. It contains, however, several interesting fragments of Byzantine Constantinople, 
including this impressive sarcophagus, which held the remains of the 12th century empress Irene. We'll see her mosaic portrait inside. In the meantime, however, we'll pass through one of five doors into the narthex. The narthex foreshadows the splendor of the rest of the church. The ceiling sparkles with golden mosaic, and here, as in the rest of the building, the floor and walls are finished with fine marble. Justinian's builders used more than a dozen types of colored marble imported from every part of the Mediterranean world. The marble revetment of the walls is especially fine. Often, slabs were sawn in two, and then opened like a book to showcase symmetrical patterns in the stone. Sometimes, by accident or design, the patterns were called the shapes of animals or human faces. At the south end of the narthex is the vestibule of the warriors. Since this side of the building faced the imperial palace, emperors often entered here. Their bodyguards would wait in the vestibule, whence the name. The vestibule's beautiful bronze doors are about 700 years older than the church itself. The emperor Theophilus removed them from an ancient temple and installed them here in the 9th century. The circles and size in the panels are imperial monograms. Above the doors is a mosaic, which shows Mary and the Christ child flanked by emperors. The emperor on the left is Justinian, offering Mary a model of Hagia Sophia. The emperor on the right is Constantine, presenting a model of Constantinople. The largest of the doors, from the atrium to the nave, is the imperial gate. As the name suggests, this door was only opened when an emperor processed into the church. After the Turkish conquest, only Ottoman sultans could use it. As far as we can tell, the bronze doors are original. A Byzantine tradition claimed that they were framed with wood from Noah's Ark. The mosaic over the imperial gate dates to the 10th century. It shows Christ in a jeweled throne, flanked by circular portraits of Mary and an angel. The prostrate man at Christ's feet is probably the 9th century emperor Leo VI, who had a fraught relationship with the church. By orthodox canon law, no man or woman can marry more than three times. But Leo had three wives die young, and, desperate to sire an heir, made an illegal fourth marriage to his mistress Zoe. The patriarch refused to sanction the marriage, and repeatedly barred Leo from entering the church at this very door. Leo, frustrated, dismissed the patriarch. After Leo's death, however, the patriarch was reappointed, and commissioned this mosaic, which shows the emperor begging for forgiveness, as a salutary reminder of patriarchal authority. Now we walk into the enormous nave, crowned by the famous dome. Even for modern tourists, accustomed to the vast interior spaces made possible by steel and concrete, this is an awe-inspiring space. It feels even bigger than it is, thanks to the curving crescendos of the ceilings and the natural light that spills through the serried windows. Every time I visit, I'm reminded of the story about the Russian envoys who reported that, upon entering Hagia Sophia, they no longer knew whether they were in heaven or on earth. The central square of the nave is bounded by four colossal piers. These piers are joined by gigantic arches, which support the pendentives on which the dome rests. The dome is 102 feet in diameter, exceeded among ancient buildings only by the Pantheon in Rome. It is, however, much taller than the Pantheon's dome, soaring more than 180 feet above the pavement. None of medieval Europe's great Gothic cathedrals had an interior so tall or remotely as spacious. Even today, in fact, the Dome of Hagia Sophia is the third largest masonry dome on the planet. Despite its size, the dome is only a little more than two feet thick. Originally, the walls on the north and south sides of the nave had much larger windows than they do now, and many of the surfaces now covered by dull plaster shimmered with golden mosaic. On a sunny day, when the mosaics glowed and the marble walls shone, it must have really seemed, as one Byzantine author reported, as though the dome were suspended from heaven by a golden chain. From the beginning, Hagia Sophia's daring design caused structural problems. When the building was still under construction, it was discovered that the piers in which the dome would rest had begun to lean alarmingly. The emperor himself suggested that the weight of the great arches connecting the piers would even out their settling, he was right, but the piers never really straightened out, and the dome had to be made slightly elliptical to compensate, as you can see in this picture. The structure, moreover, remained unstable, and in 558, 
Only 20 years after it was finished, the dome collapsed. It was rebuilt by a nephew of one of the original architects, and rededicated on Christmas Eve 563, with Justinian, now in his 80s, presiding. This dome is basically the one that we see today, though a third of it collapsed in 989, and another third came down in 1346. Just below the dome are mosaics of four seraphim, the six-winged angels, said to sit before the throne of God. The seraph shown here is the best preserved example, and the only one whose face has been uncovered. Turning from the ceiling to the floor, check out the so-called omphalos, a square of inlaid marble centered on the huge granite disc that marks the spot where the emperor sat during his coronation ceremony. At the east end of the nave is the apse, the semicircular recess that once held the high altar. Although the altar and its elaborate silver screen are long gone, the exceptionally fine marble paneling of the walls still marks this as the most important part of the building. The apse now houses the mirab, the niche that indicates the direction of Mecca for Muslim prayer. Since Hagia Sophia's recent reconversion into a mosque, the mosaics of the apse have often been covered. But if the drapes are drawn back, you can still see this beautiful 9th century representation of Mary with the Christ child. The apse was flanked by colossal images of the archangels Gabriel and Michael. Michael has vanished, but Gabriel is still partly preserved. The feathers of his wings, rendered with tesserae of many colors, are especially impressive. The Mary and Gabriel mosaics were unveiled on Easter Sunday, 867. They commemorated the end of iconoclasm, a movement that targeted devotional images of Jesus, Mary, and the saints as blasphemous. It's one of those little ironies of history that these mosaics now have to be covered. The marble capitals of the columns around the nave are deeply and elaborately carved. Although all the capitals belong to the so-called basket style and are decorated with sprays of leaves, no two are exactly alike. Almost all bear the circular monograms of Justinian and Theodora. The example on the right side of this picture contains the letters of Basileus, or emperor. Many of the columns, made of fine marble and Egyptian porphyry, are impressive in themselves. None, however, are as famous as a nondescript stone pier in the North Isle. This is the so-called weeping column. Centuries ago, a saint supposedly endowed this column with healing powers. Ever after, according to the faithful, the column exuded beads of moisture with the ability to cure diseases of the eyes and infertility. Eventually, alarmed by the hollows that pilgrims were wearing in the pillar, church authorities plated it with bronze. But pious fingers bored a hole through the casing, and tourists still line up to sample the pillar's prowess. Not far from the weeping column, we follow a spiral ramp up to the galleries, and emerge on one end of the West Gallery, directly above the narthex. In the early Byzantine period, worshippers at Hagia Sophia were separated by gender. Men stood in the nave, while women watched from the galleries. The green marble disc set in the middle of the West Gallery's floor, flanked by fine marble columns, marks the site of the Empress's throne. From here, Theodora and half a hundred of her successors watched masses and ceremonies unfold in the nave below. Passing the site of the Empress's throne, we turn to the South Gallery, where we encounter the marble screen rather fancifully known as the Gates of Heaven and Hell. This was erected sometime in the Middle Ages to cordon off part of the South Gallery, either for the use of the imperial family or for meetings of Orthodox prelates. Just beyond the marble screen is the finest of Hagia Sophia's mosaics, the Deesis. Mary and John the Baptist standing on either side of Christ, interceding for the salvation of mankind. The quality of this example is exceptional. The mosaics are so fine they seem almost painted, and their naturalism, reminiscent of the early Italian Renaissance, is worlds apart from the stylized and hieratic figures we usually associate with Byzantine art. Along the wall opposite the Deesis mosaic is a small slab, this marked the grave of Enrico Dandolo, the Doge of Venice. Though almost 90 years old and completely blind, Dandolo led the Fourth Crusade, meant to retake Jerusalem. But thanks to a combination of poor organization and pure greed, the expedition intended to defend the Holy Land ended up attacking and pillaging the greatest city in the Christian world. 
the Byzantine aristocracy fled to the provinces, and the Crusaders installed themselves in the half-ruined city of Constantinople. When Dandolo died, he was buried here, in the churches men had sacked, at the heart of the empire, he had done more than anyone else to destroy. On the wall at the south gallery's end are two remarkable mosaics. The one on the left is the so-called Zoe mosaic. Zoe was one of Byzantium's more colorful empresses. Denied power by a series of dynastic accidents, she languished in the great palace until she was almost 50 years old, when she married a nobleman and took the throne. But the marriage was unhappy, and after a few years, Zoe poisoned her husband. On the same day her first husband expired, she married her young lover, who duly became the new emperor. Zoe's lover, however, only lasted a few years before illness took his life. On his deathbed, he insisted that Zoe adopt his nephew. This youth, in turn, was made the next emperor. The people of Constantinople, however, revolted in her favor, and she returned to the throne, now accompanied by her elderly sister. But eventually, tired of squabbling and sharing power with her sibling, Zoe married a former lover, who became Emperor Constantine IX. Constantine is the emperor pictured on this mosaic. If you look closely, you can see that the head has been replaced. Scholars assume the mosaic originally represented Zoe's first husband, who was then replaced by her second husband, and finally by our friend Constantine. The other mosaic on the east wall of the south gallery shows Mary and the Christ child, flanked by the 12th century emperor John II and his wife Irene. John was, by all accounts, an excellent emperor, who managed to stabilize the Byzantine frontiers in an era of constant warfare. He was also famously devoted to his wife Irene, a Hungarian princess originally named Piroska. Both appear here in their full regalia, their silken robes studded with hundreds of gems. John and Irene's oldest son, heir apparent to the imperial throne, was Alexius, shown on the wall next to his parents. Unfortunately, as his gaunt portrait suggests, Alexius was sickly and died before his father. This mosaic, probably commissioned to commemorate his coronation as co-emperor, remained as a melancholy witness to his parents' hopes. As you're walking back to the West Gallery, pause at the marble railing opposite the Deesis mosaic to check out this runic inscription. Although it's badly worn now, it seems to have read, Helfdane was here. Helfdane was probably a member of the Varangian Guard, an elite Byzantine unit composed mainly of warriors from Scandinavia. Backtracking past the Empress's throne, we head down the North Gallery. The highlight here is an excellent mosaic of a terrible emperor. Alexander, shown here, was lazy, lecherous, and usually drunk. When he fell off his horse and died during an inebriated game of polo, few of his subjects mourned. As his mosaic portrait shows, however, he could wear ceremonial robes with the best of them. I especially like the jeweled slippers. Before leaving the North Gallery, take a look at the Greek graffiti along the marble railing, probably etched by centuries of bored imperial pages. Let's take a last look at the nave. Especially if you visit late at night, when the lights are low and few other tourists are around, it's hard to escape the sense of history here. This was the backdrop of Byzantine history, the coronations and feast days, the ritual and intrigue. It was here that Constantine XI, the last Byzantine emperor, prayed the night before he died in the walls of Constantinople. And it was here, on the very next day, that Mohammed the Conqueror stood on the altar and proclaimed building a mosque. So it remained until Ataturk made it a museum, and so, recently and controversially, it has become again. Fortunately, people of all faiths can still visit and appreciate this wonderful building, one of the most enduring legacies of a vanished world. I hope you enjoyed our whirlwind tour of Hagia Sophia. If you do visit, besides seeing the highlights so briefly profiled here, I encourage you to spend some time just walking through the building and savoring its many layers of history. I promise you won't regret it. If you'd like to read more about Hagia Sophia, you can find a short list of recommended books and other interesting tidbits on toldenstone.com. I plan to keep posting videos exploring classical buildings and museums on a semi-regular basis. To be sure you don't miss the next one, feel free to subscribe. In the meantime, as always, thanks for watching.